Between 1979 and 1989, 150,000 Cambodians came to the United States. Fung Huynh's family was part of that influx of immigrants. Fung is an artist and educator based in Los Angeles. I spoke with her about how her family history and the refugee experience helped to shape her artwork. I met Fung at her home studio in Los Angeles. I see um, art making as connecting with community and people and hope to either uplift them or, or empower them or make them think about their own narratives. So that's how I view and see art. I don't see art as something that is an autonomous object that people buy and display, but I really hope to connect with people who look at my work. I also hope that you know art just doesn't live in elitist places like galleries and museums but they could be anywhere. Fung's work includes drawings, paintings, and public art, and has been exhibited nationally and internationally. Fung is also a professor of art at Los Angeles Valley College. Your parents' story is amazing and inspirational and is a part of who you are. So can you share uh, you know, their journey to this country and how it shaped who you are, do you think? Definitely. So my father is Cambodian and adopted by Chinese parents. And my mother is of Chinese ancestry born in Vietnam, and I was also born there. And in 1978, my father decided we had, we had to leave. All the violence and war in Southeast Asia was just, you know, it was impossible for my family and I to survive. And so in 1978, my father took my mom, our entire immediate family, my grandparents, extended family, cousins, aunts and uncles, and we were settled. We, we left and we um, landed in a Thai refugee camp. I've talked to a lot of uh, people who've grown up and, and uh, you know, as a child, it's, you're going to be a doctor, you're going to be an engineer. This is kind of, and they all have kind of similar narratives. Uh, and when I talk to people who are either artists or, or uh, authors, you know, they all seem to have that kind of struggle with their parents, like, no, this is what I want to do. Did you have any of that? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, both my parents are refugees, you know, came here with nothing. They had to go through so much, right, to bring us here. And so, like many refugees and immigrant parents, they want their children to get a college education, to do better. So when I said, you know, I think I want to be an artist, it was no way. There's just, there's no, <laughs> no way you're going to, how are you going to make a living? You know, what, for my father, um, yeah, they wanted me to doc be a doctor or a lawyer. You know, um, and a lot of this was about stability and we wanted better for you. We did all this for better for you. Um, the ironic part is the kind of resilience and the, go, the will that my parents had is the same thing that made me want to be an artist. That I'm, I can do it. You won't, you won't see me starve. Watch me. I'm not going to starve. Um, and now, being in my 40s making work, the most wonderful thing is I'm making work about you and for you. One of Fung's most well-known works is her Donut Box portrait series. Nearly 90% of donut shops in California are run by Cambodian immigrants or Cambodian Americans. The portraits portray family members and friends, as well as cultural figures, like writer Viet Thanh Nguyen and filmmaker Rai Thi Pan. The project was inspired by research and interviews Fung did with Vietnamese and Cambodian refugees. So let's talk about donuts uh, and, and how they, because uh, I'm telling you, I think your artwork's amazing and, and uh, to see it on donut boxes and that sort of thing, I never would have thought of that. Can you talk about the inspiration for that and, uh, and about that work? Absolutely. Well, Mike, I've always wanted to make work about my family's refugee story. That's always been something I wanted to do, but um, how to do it and when to do it took some time. 
because I struggled with making like re-traumatizing my parents again by right uncovering and unpacking these stories or I didn't want to exploit the, the narrative but I knew at some point I wanted to and so a few years ago um, uh, my colleague gave me a newspaper article about do you know why donut boxes in California are pink and it's because of Cambodian immigrants and I'm like of course I know why are you educating me on something that I always knew and grew up with in my community growing up with a lot of family members and um, friends of family who owned can, uh, donut shops or worked in donut shops. And then it clicked. It's that pink box. That's the relic and the symbol of our narrative. And then I started researching and interviewing people in my community and made portraits on these pink donut boxes. And like you said, Mike, no one would ever have thought, right? Like a donut is such a, uh, an everyday thing. Everybody eats a donut here in the United States. And uh, a, a box as a canvas is not something most people would think of. I mean, that's kind of a, a spark of genius in a sense. I mean, did it come to you right away or? For me, I'm a community-based artist, so I love this idea of making art that everyday people can have access to. It's not this precious thing uh, on canvas or golden, you know, a gilt frame. Um, yeah, it's every, anybody can get a box of donuts. Like this is, you know, not this super precious elitist material, but by literally drawing portraits of my family and community members on the pink donut box, I, I have this physical connection and this constant reminder of why I'm doing this work. And you're also conveying that to an audience who's receiving your art uh, as well, who may not have been aware prior to. I did hear the NPR story about it. Were you surprised that it, it generated that kind of interest from the news media? Yes, yes and no. Um, uh, honored that it received such uh, grand reception, but also, well, it's about time. <laughs> you know what I mean? It was really about trauma and violence and um, refugees coming, but then the pink donut box is like, well, what happened afterwards? You know, what happened to that narrative afterwards? So I'm really grateful and happy that folks are interested in, in learning about that narrative and not just the genocide. Yeah. Yeah, it's so interesting you put it that way because you think about uh, the bitter quality of the first part of the story and then the sweet, you know, you think of donuts as sweet and the sweet part of the story that, that you know, they can come and have the American dream in a sense. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that dichotomy and juxtaposition makes it really interesting because people would never have thought like this wonderful donut that, you know, you can you you bring to the classroom or at the workplace that there's also a very um, traumatic narrative and and I do I really like that combination. We always talk about how the United States is this melting pot and clearly your family is an example of that and you can go anywhere in Southern California and find a lots of different examples and yet you have another segment of our society. There's the other. We've got to be afraid of the other and these mm -hmm. people are on the on the border and they want to come here and they want to take over our country and there's these two competing narratives. Um, what do you say to that? Well, I'm on the other side. Well, of, course, <laughs> of course you are, but, but I mean, how, how difficult uh, is it to listen to that when clearly... Well, that's how the donut boxes came about, Mike, because it was during the Trump administration and there was um, extreme anti-immigrant sentiment, a lot of racism, misogyny, but also a lot of Cambodian and, and Vietnamese were being deported during his administration, right? Like a lot of folks of my generation who were born in Cambodia and Vietnam came here and their parents are so traumatized and they live in underserved neighborhoods and join gang life, go into prison, you're done with prison time, you're deported, right? So a lot, uh, so all of this is happening and that spearheaded me okay, it's time to make this, this kind of work now because I'm really tired of, of seeing this, of seeing this and seeing our, our narratives not, not centered. Um, and I think that's, that's why we're so polarized is because there's a whole group of people who felt attacked and our stories not being represented and silenced. And the other side, well, it's always been that way. And why are you, cha why are you changing the narrative? There's always been the narrative, right? Um, and I'm, I'm like... I'm sorry, but I, I don't, I'm not here to change anybody's minds. 
this is who I am. This is why I make art. I'm, I'm really an advocate for social justice. I'm really an advocate to bring underrepresented histories and narratives to the forefront. I'm interested in, in my community and folks who are our allies and amplifying those voices. That's where I'm putting my energy. Some of Fung's most provocative works raise questions about cultural representation and specifically the westernization of Asian beauty standards. One of the things that you talk about w through your work um, is this uh, beauty standard and uh, cosmetic surgery and kind of the whitewashing of your community. Can you talk about that? I think that is a real big trend, uh, cosmetic surgery amongst Asian and Asian American women. Um, I've, I read that the statistic in Korea right now, one in three women in Korea have undergone some sort of cosmetic surgery, right? Um, so I was interested in that. And even growing up, um, you know, the double eyelid surgery or blepharoplasty is really fit, uh, common. Um, amongst East Asian women with monolithic eyes. So I remember when I was younger, my mom would say, you know, do you want to get that done at all? You know, or my cousin's getting nose jobs. And I have Jewish friends like, yeah, that's the thing, right? Like that's your graduation present is some sort of cosmetic surgery. And so I started thinking about this and how it's very patriarchal, but also um, there are some racist, you know, underpinnings to that and this whole idea of whitewashing because when Asian women and Asian American women get plastic surgery, it's usually to make themselves look more white or adhere to Western uh, beauty standards. Um, and it also reminds me of things when I was growing up, listening to narratives of like grandmothers and mothers saying, you better pinch your kids' noses, otherwise it'll go flat, you know? Um, and yeah, so I was really interested in and compare and contrasting like the current trends of cosmetic surgery on Asian bodies with like the narratives that I grew up with as well. What's been the overall reaction? Um, very mixed. And I'm glad you brought that up. It's like really, especially being in, in Los Angeles, I think the pressure of Hollywood and the movie industry and this idea of having to look beautiful. But, you know, that beauty isn't um, diverse. It's very, very set. Right, like being thin, having big breasts and looking more, you know, white, right? Like, so like Asian women bleaching their hair, getting colored contacts on top of that. So the response to that body of work has been very mixed as well. Um, some folks think, yeah, it's wrong. I can't believe this. Or once I gave a lecture about that body of work and um, a, Ch a Chinese woman actually was very offended by my work. And she's like, well, that's how I see, that's how I want to look like so um, and it's not I'm not trying to look white that's what I feel is beautiful and that's that's how I want to look and my my question to her well where did these ideas of you becoming beautiful come from were you looking at magazines and movies and or beauty products with advertising you know you really need to look at that and she was really upset about my response but well good for you though sobre vivir meaning to survive in Spanish, is one of Fung's newest works of art, commissioned by the Los Angeles County Department of Arts and Culture. The public sculpture brings attention to the more than 200 women, mostly from Mexico, who underwent forced sterilizations at the Los Angeles County USC Medical Center in the late 1960s and early 1970s. So a lot of these mothers would go into labor and often given papers to sign to sterilize them um, and they didn't know what they were signing and they would sign off. Um, and they would go home and years later realize they were not getting pregnant when they were trying to have children. Um, so California has a history of forced sterilizations and eugenics and um, one of the highest in all of the country. So in 2018, the LA County Board of Supervisors wanted to acknowledge the shameful history and apologize to the mothers. And uh, part of expressing these apologies was hiring an artist to create an artwork about this. And so that's what I did. Um, as an artist, I created a large permanent artwork made of quartz and steel to honor the mothers who were forced to sterilize during the 60s and 70s and um, to express these apologies and to respectfully honor them. A part of doing that and creating that, and I hope you can talk about this, is 
you have to absorb the story before you create. And there's that whole part that's going through you. I mean, sitting there and thinking about these women and what happened to them and this, as you say, shameful history, and yet it's kind of a hidden history. Most people don't even know this history exists. Um, talk to me about that whole process and then having to create something. Uh, there's, I would think there's, there's probably some pressure on you. Like, how do I really capture something to really connect with somebody who's looking at this to really convey the horror of this? Uh, it's, it's a tough job, I would think. It is, and an honor. It's tough, but it's also an honor. There's so many artists, so many talented, incredible artists who could have done this. And I feel extremely honored that I was entrusted to do this. And so when I'm approaching a narrative that is deeply traumatic and entrenched in these horrific events that women had and mothers had to survive, it's not my story to tell. So I'm a conduit. In, in, in my own personal work about my family, that's different because that's our story, that's my story. But in this instance where it's not my story, it's a deeply traumatic story of somebody else's, then I'm a conduit for them. So what that means is really listening to the stories of the moms. And I'm very fortunate to have seen the documentary No Mas Bebes that was um, and produced by Virginia Espino, who's an incredible Chicana scholar, and um, Renee Tajima Pena. And so that documentary allowed me to listen and hear the stories from the mothers themselves, which I think is very important because when they were at the hospitals, they were villainized for being Mexican immigrant mothers, not speaking the language and silenced. And so for me to be able to hear them speak in their language, in Spanish, what they went through was deeply meaningful and impactful. Um, and, um, and even meeting their daughters and listening to community members, because when you make art for a community, the community has to identify with it and that they have, it has to resonate with them because ultimately they're gonna be the custodians for the artwork. Thank you so much for visiting with us, really appreciate it. Thanks, Mike.